Hello, Bioneers. Getting organized here. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom, and all the Bioneers all over the place. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Kenny and Nina as well and all the Bioneer staff for making this event possible. <clears throat> and I'd like to say hello to my friends uh, up in Alaska and in Seattle and all the different satellite uh, places that uh, we're plugged into today because today we're one tribe. And I'd also like to uh, say hello to all my friends. I've been able to see some of you uh, at different events. And uh, there's several Alaskans here as well. Uh, so it's an absolute honor to be here with all of you today. My EAC name is Jamatsuki. And which means uh, the little bird that screams really loud and won't shut up. <clears throat> so the timekeeper, if you could just point your hand, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so you can tell me when to shut up. Uh, my people, the Eak, uh, have lived along the Copper River Delta for the last 3,500 years. We migrated uh, from the interior of Alaska down to the coastline. And uh, we probably inhabited about a 300-mile stretch of, of uh, homeland between Yakutat, which means uh, an Eak word for lagoon behind the sea. And we migrated to the west, ended up in Cordova and eastern Prince William Sound. I would like to make a disclaimer. I cannot see Russia from my home. <laughs> And the other thing is a point of context for you is that uh, along with being a part of the uh, EAC Traditional Elders Council and an EAC native, I've also been incorporated into an Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act corporation. And unlike in America where the indigenous peoples were put on reservations, land reserved for Indian people, they forced us into forming native corporations up in Alaska. So as I speak, that'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So rather than receive uh, the lands and uh, have sovereignty and, and uh, tribal uh, ownership, the land in Alaska held by native peoples are owned by the native corporations, which we're all shareholders of. I grew up fishing in Prince William Sound in the Copper River Delta with uh, seven little Indians. Um, Mom, she was uh, uh, an amazing woman. Uh, she would always tell all of her children that um, there was nothing stronger in this world than your belief in yourself and your dreams. And one tide alone, my mother dug 2,000 pounds of razor clams. That's an amazing feat. And as I was growing up, I watched the razor clams uh, disappear in, in my lifetime. Growing up on the ocean, uh, I experienced, <clears throat> as a fisherman, uh, we would take our trash and we would just dump it overboard. And all the fishermen did that. And I asked my father one day, I said, <clears throat> why are we doing this? This is our home and this is where we fish. Why would we ever want to do this? And he said, what are you, an environmentalist? And I was like, seven. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I go, why would you want to throw the trash into the water because it ends up on the beaches. And, and uh, so within about four or five years, uh, all of the fishermen uh, then started loading their trash on the tenders and bringing it in the town. So no longer did that happen. When I was in my early teens, uh, what, uh, I was crab fishing with my family. And in the crab pots, there are, um, there's no way for the, the mamas and the babies to get out of the uh, crab pots because there was no outlets for them to escape. And so I asked my dad, I said, well, you know, how come we don't have an escapement for these little crabs and the mamas and babies? 
And he said, what are you, an environmentalist? I said, well, I go, it just seems to me that if we're going to keep fishing for these crab, then they have to escape so we can have ones in the future, right? And uh, so within a couple years, uh, he dropped these hog rings and these rings onto the floor of the shop and said, you got your wish. Put these hog rings in and, and you'll have an escapement hatch for the future crab. But uh, within... <laughs> But unfortunately, within uh, five or six years, uh, the crab were fished out as well. And I remember seeing the first uh, kayak and the first sailboat come into Prince William Sound. Uh, I knew that we had been discovered, that the last of uh, having this incredible paradise to ourselves was, uh, was over, that uh, I realized that I was going to have to share it uh, with the rest of the world. And. And that was tough because I remember when another boat would come into the bay that we were fishing, my father would leave and we're like, another human, and we're waving and, and uh, he'd want to take off. He goes, no, 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 there's too many people in this bay. <laughs> and uh, so we grew up fairly isolated, but we lived uh, off the seasons of animals and, um, and the seasons of salmon and the herring and halibut and, you know, it was just absolutely incredible. And uh, I believe that it would last forever. But as Tom said uh, when he was introducing me, uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill changed my life. It was the nation's worst oil spill. And unfortunately, it took the nation's worst oil spill to wake me up. And to me, that was the day that the water died. That was also the day that something inside of me came to life. And I realized that I would have to become a formless warrior that I would have to figure out how to become a defender of my land and my people, and that I would have to be louder than everything else. And that was difficult for me because I had never spoken publicly before, and, and I was terrified. But I was fortunate to have uh, several incredible activists, uh, community activists in our community, uh, Rick Steiner, David Grimes, uh, Ricky Ott, uh, later uh, Carol Hoover, uh, Karen Button, just amazing, amazing activists that came together and uh, we were able to uh, do uh, the unspeakable and impossible, which I'll share with you in a moment. But in order to learn how to speak publicly, what I did was I went up to this place where uh, there, a log had fallen down uh, for natural causes and this log was laying across this spot and it was about 25 feet in the air and I'd walk out on the log and then I'd start speaking and then when I would lose my concentration, I'd almost fall off the log. And so I had to really uh, focus and so it, it helped me. <laughs> and I remember uh, right before um, the Exxon Valley Oil Spill Trustee Council met in uh, Anchorage for the first time, and I wanted to go up there and speak in behalf of the land and the animals and our people and, and be a voice of reason and a voice for the ones who couldn't speak, which was the wildlife and the salmon. And so I'd asked my sister Pamela to come along with me, but prior to that going up, I went out to Eak Lake and to the sacred spot and uh, I started saying my prayers and, and talking to the spirits that be and our ancestors. And I said, I need your help, I need your advice. You're going to have to help me because I have no idea what I'm going to say. And I'm scared. And I need to see a green arrow in the sky. And it was foggy, it was drizzly. You know, what were the odds of that happening? And it was September, early October, uh, silvers were running. And after venting for about an hour at the top of my lungs, um, the uh, clouds kind of parted and there was like uh, an opening where I could see Eak Mountain, which is this old uh, crater, this old uh, volcano crater, uh, Eak Mountain. And all of a sudden the northern lights just started dancing this beautiful chartreuse green, this brilliant green uh, behind the silhouette of, of Eak Mountain. And all of a sudden, that cloud opening became like this halo of green light, and it came down to the water and came shimmering across the water. And silver salmon started jumping, splashing in the ripples of water, and an eagle flew over the top of me and shrieked. 
and it shrieked and I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I was like, now that I have your attention. <laughs> and so I went off for another hour and I said, you had better be there because I'm gonna go up there with a blank sheet of paper. And so the next day I, I flew up to Anchorage. <laughs> <laughs> so I flew up to Anchorage and um, there was um, my sister Pamela and we're sitting there and, and I have my piece of paper there and she said, well, is that your speech? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she's sitting next to me and she's getting kind of nervous and, and uh, she picks the piece of paper up and she turns it over and it's blank on both sides and she says, <laughs> Dune, I think you have the wrong piece of paper. And I said, <laughs> I said, Pamela, don't show that to him. It's a paper arrow. I said, we, our ancestors are going to be here today. And she goes, oh, yeah? And I said, yeah, I spoke to him last night at Yak Lake. <laughs> and, uh, and they're going to be there with us. And I said, so, so trust me. And all of a sudden, I could feel her hands, because she was holding my hand, she, I could feel her palms getting really sweaty. And she's like, oh my God. And uh, she goes, what are you gonna say? And I said, I have no idea, but they better show up real soon. <laughs> and so, my time came and, and I was able to speak, um, and these words flowed from me that I had no idea where they come from. I, I remembered things that I never knew, and I saw, what I had to do in order to be this voice of reason and to be able to be this formless warrior. And one of the uh, lawyers from the trustees council came up to me afterwards and asked me for a copy of my speech. <laughs> and I said, well, I gave her this blank piece of paper and she goes, oh my God. And I said, well, I didn't know what to say. And she said, uh, I would have likened that speech to Chief Seattle when he lost his land. <laughs> But but one of the things that, that really woke me up was uh, I, when I was younger, I used to pioneer fisheries around the state of Alaska and also in Arizona to remove the carp, which is the a rough fish the, and the buffalo fish out of the lakes for the government because they use this poison called rhodanone and they would pour it into the water, suffocate all the fish, kill all of them and then pour a neutralizer in there and then it was safe for you to drink the water again. And I'm like, yeah, right. And so I started, you know, commercial fishing down there and I got this phone call this one day and it was shortly after the spill and it was my sister Pamela and I was putting my tennis shoes on and getting ready to play hoops against the crew. And uh, so I kicked open the door and uh, they were out there playing and the phone rang and I decided I wasn't gonna answer it. And uh, it was Pamela. And she said, Dune, the CEO just came out of the, uh, his office in the EAC Corporation headquarters and said, now the eyes of the world are focused on the ocean and the nation's worst oil spill, so we need to clear cut as fast as we possibly can. So what you need to do is come home now and fight for our land and our people, or don't bother coming home because there's not gonna be anything left. And I realized right then that, um, I had to do everything in my power to find the strength to stand up and be that voice for the other people who were afraid. And I had to sue my people. I had to take on my corporations. I had to stand there. But I realized that I wasn't alone, that there were many people that cared about the place, but there was no indigenous peoples that were willing to stand except my family and some of my cousins. And so we ended up, um, you know, having to go to court several times. They sued me a couple of times. But the bottom line was all I wanted was a right to vote and decide between conservation over development. And so what had happened was um, our corporation was able to vote. Uh, I didn't have to get a court order vote. But 87% uh, of the shareholders voted in favor of conservation, and we did it 13 more times in the spill zone, saving over 700,000 acres of trees.
And this led to paying indigenous peoples over $400 million to leave their trees standing and protecting their subsistence way of life. What a concept. So my feeling was is that um, what we needed to do was to figure out how we could continue doing conservation because one of the deals that I did not like about that transaction was it had to be one-third uh, conservation easement or development restriction, one-third uh, timber harvesting rights, and then one-third um, uh, fee simple title, which meant that we had to give up title to our land in the name of conservation. And so I decided to start the Native Conservancy Land Trust. And so it would not just protect endangered plants and animals, but endangered peoples in their culture. And I felt that this was really important because we're all fighting over the same pots of money when it comes to conservation around the planet. So the best thing that we could possibly do is create a new avenue, a new way of funding and bring humanity into conservation. So I felt that by starting the Native Conservancy Land Trust with the amazing Winona LaDuke, uh, the amazing Gwich'in leader Sarah James and my sister Pamela, that we could make a difference. Now there's several organizations around the state uh, indigenous peoples that want to start Native Conservancy chapters so they can start buying and purchasing up endangered lands and Native allotments that tribal members own that they're selling um, to outsiders, to people who want to develop the land or, or turn it into a guide business. So I really feel that the Native Conservancy uh, will be a good uh, avenue for them to look at retaining those lands and not having to give them up in, in fee title, but preserving and protecting them for all time. <laughs> then uh, I wasn't done there. I decided that um, we would start a fire fund, which was the Fund for Indigenous Rights in the Environment. And the idea there was to uh, create an organization that I could help indigenous peoples on the front line address issues on a very uh, quick basis so we could make a decision on Friday and take action by Monday. This way we could take our money and work with other foundations as a matching uh, donation. We could double or triple the monies in a very quick time, like uh, just recently, uh, we started a whole truth campaign to bring out the truth about Exxon right before the U.S. Supremes heard the case. And we realized that all of their uh, folks were getting their word out that everything was cleaned up and it was okay in the sound, but we realized that in order to get our voice to be heard, we had to organize. So the fire fund put down $10,000 and four or five other organizations matched it and we were able to get our word out there fairly quickly. Unfortunately, the U.S. Supremes weren't listening to the people, nor did they care about the environment or our losses to our way of life. So <clears throat> Exxon uh, was able to uh, get away with only a $500 million uh, settlement, which they're opposing the interest right now. And so that is really difficult because again, the people who live from the land in the ocean are the ones who are gonna have to protect the land and protect their way of life. So the most important thing that we can do right now is restore what has been destroyed and preserve what's still intact. The, uh, <clears throat> the idea uh, with the uh, fire fund is also to be able to network with uh, foundations and organizations uh, where we wouldn't normally be viewed as peers, as, as you know, being on the same level. Usually we're grantees, so it changes the dynamics a little bit having a Native Conservancy and an endowment. And, but I think it's really important that we all realize that we still have to collaborate and network and direct energy, whether that's time, money, or love, whatever direction that we need to, in order to create the change that we want to see in the world. When I think about what has happened and where we're going right now, one of the things that I wanted to leave you with is, is a really important message, and that is that uh, we need to figure out how to um, sustain ourselves in these times of great hardship and uncertainty. I mean, as we can all see, the world is crashing around us as we know it. 
and things are changing on a daily basis. But <clears throat> what we decided to do on our end is we started several um, nonprofits and we're in the process of starting several for profits. And we came up with a new equation about six, eight months ago, <clears throat> and it reads nonprofit plus for profit equals social profit. We wanted to figure out how to float our own boat in five years or less. So because of the hardship of the different foundations and them, um, you know, consolidating and merging and, and becoming more tight in how their funding is to be spent, because they want to see more slam dunks. They want to see more organized uh, nonprofits. And at the same time, uh, you know, they're going to have to really tighten their belt as well. But if we're working together in our own communities and forming uh, for-profit entities that are sustainable and good for the planet, and they complement the mission that we're doing in our nonprofit work, then we'll create that social profit because the bottom line is we're all social change artists and we just need to figure out how to take care of ourselves uh, during these crazy times. Uh, a couple of the companies, just so you know, what we're starting is Copper Wild Salmon Company. So I'm working with a bunch of my fishing buddies that I grew up with so we can direct market and value add uh, some of the wildest, highest omega seafoods on the planet, the Copper River Salmon, to all of you. The other is uh, we're opening a, an engine um, company. We're going to uh, work with Steyr Engine out of Austria, which has made a high-performance biodiesel compatible uh, boat engine, and they're also making hybrid engines. So we'll be able to look at the carbon footprint from the uh, seafood industry and reduce it as much as we possibly can. So we put two, two of the engines in one of our partner's boats last year, and he averaged uh, four gallons an hour, or 50 gallons a period, and compared to 150 gallons for the other folks. Uh, so that'll make a big difference, just having that alone. Uh, we're building a school at Night Island called the Oceanic Institute. We're opening two eco lodges next year. Uh, we're starting our wild salmon preserve legislation, calling for uh, wild salmon forever. And who can argue with that? <clears throat> uh, the last thing I'd like to do is I would like all of you to stand. And when uh, we get done uh, when our, with our river trips, what happens is uh, we bring uh, everybody together before we get back on the river the next day. And uh, we circle up. And we hold hands. So, you know, first shake it out and get, it, get rid of whatever's going on in you. And then hold hands, and then I'll hold somebody's hand here. So we're all linked together. And everybody out there in Bioneer land, you do that too. So stand up and, and we're all together. So imagine, imagine that we're standing on the edge of the Copper River. And we feel the energy of the river, the sounds of the river. That we feel the energy of, of the water because it's, it's letting off a mist that is cleansing our aura as we're standing there. And we can hear the silt swishing in the water as it's going by us at 10, 12 knots. And we can feel the silt below our feet and we're standing on it, we're part of it. And we are the animals, we are the bears, we are the river. And imagine that we're one tribe and we're one spirit with one mind, with one heart, with one mission. And we all know what we have to do. On November 4th, change is coming and you're all gonna be a part of it. So I love you all and thank you for your time. Love you too. All right. <laughs> Thank you.